Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to another weekly reading wrap up. I finished a bunch of things this past week, so let's just get straight into the books. I don't really have a preamble this week. Let's talk about the most disappointing book first to get it out of the way. I finished reading The End of the Day by Claire North and it started very strong, very interesting, and then it just got stuck in a rut, guys. So this is the second novel I have finished reading by Claire North. I really enjoyed The First 15 Lives of Harry August and I DNF'd Touch. I just didn't get along with it. And The End of the Day has such an interesting premise. It's about Charlie, a young man who has recently become the new harbinger of death. Charlie is a very normal man who just happens to be employed by death, and his job as a harbinger is not to just go to tell people they're going to die, but he says he goes as a warning as well as a courtesy. And death doesn't just come for people, he also comes for ideas and such. And when I first started this book, I thought that the story was really going to be how Charlie learns more about life and living and how to be a good person through this job. He does a ton of traveling and meets so many people and sees so many different ways of living and decisions people can make and such. And it was also packing in a lot of social issues. I was buddy reading this book with Shannon from That So Po, and she pointed out that because this book was published, I think in 2017, it might have been written around 2016 when, you know, turmoil in the world, and that that might have influenced how Claire North just threw all the issues into this. She doesn't really go into depth on any of them. You have like abortion rights and feminism and the wage gap and climate change and so many other things, but it's very shallowly touched on. The first part of the book has this really interesting section, a story about Charlie going to find a man in Greenland, I think, Greenland or Iceland, and I thought it was gonna really explore the topic of climate change and then we just skip to something else in the next part. And I think it's that fragmentary, very fractured nature of the structure of the story that weakened it so much that it almost fell apart completely by the end for me. It's too scattered, there isn't enough plot, and it doesn't go in depth on enough things. This book also started with what I thought was a good dollop of humor. It reminded me a lot of Good Omens and the Death Books by Terry Pratchett. And then it suddenly started to get darker and there's some violence and some gruesome torture scenes and I was just mentally checked out by the last third or so. Then on audiobook, I listened to State Tectonics by Malka Older. This is the third and final novel in her Sentinel Cycle series, which begins with Infomocracy and Null States. And I pretty much loved this book. It wasn't perfect, and part of that is because I had forgotten so much from the first two books. Even though all the characters in this, like Roz and Miriam, and I think even Amran, um, are returning from previous books, I didn't remember anything about them. Oh, except for Mishima. I remembered more about Mishima because she's the awesome spy person, basically. Um, but I kind of think I should have reread the first two books if I wanted to remember a lot of the fine details. Nevertheless, I really got sucked into this book and sucked back into the world. And I don't want to like spoil the whole plot of the series or anything, but basically it's about data monopolies and data privacy and potential competitors arising against um, information, which is kind of like Google in a way in this, in this future, and it was really fascinating. I think part of the reason why I didn't get as much out of the first two books despite enjoying them is because I was reading them as e-arcs on my phone back in the day and I had to read them in a rush because the e-arcs expired. I could take my own sweet time with State Tectonics and I enjoyed it a lot more. So yeah, this is a series that I think I might have to reread in the future. Then there is What Language Is and What It Isn't and What It Could Be by John McWhorter. This is a short nonfiction book where McWhorter describes what he thinks are like key characteristics of what a normal language is, and it was pretty interesting for the topic. 
um, like it's broken down into chapters like language is disheveled, language is oral, language is intricate. And I liked the kind of argument structure of the book overall, um, but I felt like within the individual chapters it was a bit of a mess. Um, actually, in the last chapter, McWhorter makes a comment about how some people don't like his writing style because it's more spoken rather than composed, and I think that might have been part of the problem for me. There are so many interesting examples of how actual completely normal languages function, and I enjoyed that so much. But the organization of this book was weird. I honestly felt like the author was continually interrupting the flow of his argument by saying, oh, but one more cool example. Let me explain some of that and do a summary paragraph. Oh, but wait, one more example. And I started to feel like he wasn't stating like his topic sentences and his conclusions in a very clear way. It was really frustrating, especially for a book about language where I felt like his his language, the way he was speaking to the reader, was way more convoluted and messy than it needed to be. Despite that, I kind of like his approach to like linguistics and language history. I think McWhorter's focus is on the socio-historical evolution of languages, and he gives a lot of examples of that in here, and I found it to be very interesting. So I think that this particular book is a bit weird. <laughs> I think it's just a bit of an oddball book, and perhaps some of his other works might be a bit more coherent. I think I will check them out if I can get them from the library. A middle grade horror novel, Small Spaces by Catherine Arden. I've been meaning to read more by Catherine Arden for a while now. I have read The Bear and the Nightingale, but despite thinking it was a good book, I never continued on with the other two books in that series. I was far more interested in checking out Small Spaces, even though I don't read a lot of middle grade and I definitely don't read a lot of horror. This was still fun. I didn't think it was a super special book. It didn't wow me or anything, but I enjoyed it and I definitely plan to read the rest of the series. So Small Spaces is about a sixth grade girl named Ollie. Um, she's still kind of dealing with the death of her mother who died about a year prior to the story starting. She's kind of pushed herself away from everybody at school. And then one day she encounters a strange woman who is very upset and is trying to throw a book into the local river, and Ollie takes the book from her and discovers that it's called Small Spaces, and it's kind of a ghost story set um, at like a farm near her community. Then, shortly after that, she goes on a school trip to that farm and re-encounters the woman that she got the book from, and creepy stuff ensues. You know, scarecrows are creepy even on a good day, but then animate them and make them slightly evil. I, the reason I don't read a lot of horror, like I'm not interested in it very much, is because I scare very easily. And even though this was middle grade and pretty tame, I had to stop reading it in like the middle portion um, because it was late at night and I was just like really creeped out. <laughs> So it definitely has some chills in it, it definitely has some tension, um, but not too much for the intended audience, though. I enjoyed it enough to go on to the next book, which is called Dead Voices, and yeah, it, it wasn't amazing, but it was a decent way to pass the time. And lastly for this week, I read Mooncakes by Wendy Hsu and Suzanne Walker. This is a really sweet and lovely graphic novel about a witch and a werewolf who are friends as children and then the werewolf moved away, but now they have come back to town and they resume their friendship and a little bit of a budding romance, and they team up to look into a demon in the local woods and some nefarious goings on. Like I said, this is really sweet. In fact, it reminded me so much of the Witch Boy series by Molly Ostertag in the artwork in some ways, definitely, but also just the, the type of the storytelling and how decent the characters are and everything. I really liked the um, story here, I liked the artwork, I liked the representation, there are queer characters, um, the werewolf is non-binary, and it just 
it was so nice. Um, I do think that I would love more out of this story. I didn't feel like it was rushed and needed to be expanded on, but I could definitely see where this could be a series to really flesh out the characters even more and give more time for gradual character development. I don't know if it's going to be a standalone. I hope that maybe someday there will be more. But yeah, it was really, really pleasant to read. So yeah, those are all the things that I finished reading this past week, and I have even more library checkouts now. <laughs> I went to the library and picked up my holds, just in case everything shut down on me, and I've checked out a bunch of things from Overdrive as well, because, you know, in times like this, digital resources at the library are some of the best things ever. I'm hoping there are not going to be major, major closures in my community, but there's no telling what may happen now. I am safe and happy at home and have no reason to go anywhere for quite a while, so I should be reading a lot or at least listening to audiobooks and working on my knitting because that is my current obsession. Anyway, I hope you are doing well. Let me know if you have read or want to read any of the books that I talked about today. Leave me a comment down below and I will talk to you again very soon and until then, bye!